taking the first um, topic. And the topic is on cutaneous clava migraine. I'll be using the following outline. As a way of introduction, cutaneous clava migraine can also be called a creeping eruption or ground itch. It's a clinical syndrome consisting of an erythematous migrating lineal or serpentinous cutaneous tract caused by the burrowing of lavas, larvae of the dog or cats who comes. Mostly the ankylosoma brasilensi and ankylosoma panium. It could also be caused by larvae of other animal parasites that are not um, natural human parasites. Epidemiology, it's a wide, it has a, a worldwide distribution and infection is more frequently in the warmer climates. Individuals at risk of, at greatest risk of um, this, this condition include travelers to the tropical region, children, swimmers, laborers, whose activity bring their skin in contact to its contaminated cells, such as farmers, walking barefooted, sitting or lying on contaminated cells, such as beach goers, and people of lower social economic communities. This is a life cycle of um, the lava. As you can see, when um, the eggs are excreted in feces of contaminated animals, of infected animals, sorry, these eggs go ahead to hash into the um, rabidity form um, lava, which would undergo some um, development to form the biliary form lava. Subsequently, this is the infective form of the larva, and it goes ahead to infect the, when it comes in contact with the human skin, it goes ahead to infect the human skin, it penetrates the human skin. However, when it comes, when the humans are infected by this larva, it does so by penetrating the skin. The larva of most species cannot mature within the human host since the humans are accidental intermediate hosts. The larva migrates within the epidemis, but it lacks the enzyme necessary to break down the basement membrane. It lacks an essential enzyme, that is the collagenase, which is important. They produce an inflammatory reaction along the cutaneous tract of their migration, which may continue for weeks. Frequently, um, the presentation is frequently seen on the lower extremities. Initially, um, a pyritic erythematous purple can develop at the site of the lava penetration. Within a few days thereafter, an intense pyritic elevated serpentinous red brown track may appear as the larvae migrates at a rate of one to two cm per day. The lesions are approximately two millimeter wide and may be, and may be up to 15 to 20 millimeter in length. This is just an image showing um, the cutaneous lava migraine. As you can see, the lava, you can see the serpentinous eruption at the dosum of the feet, of the foot of this individual. These serpentinous lesions usually develop within two to six days after an exposure, but sometimes it may take up to weeks or even months before um, they get visible, before they appear. Lesions may become vesiculated, encrusted, or secondarily infected. Associated pruritus can be so intense at it can be so intense that it can cause sleep disturbances. Eventually, this lesion resolve the lesion can resolve spontaneously even without any specific therapy. Diagnosis of this condition is basically clinical. It's it's a clinical diagnosis when we where we employ the and we take clinical history and physical examination. It's worthwhile to know that eosinophilia is rare in this condition, as we all know, since it does not go beyond the epidemics. Differential diagnosis, strongyloidiasis is the first. The main, the main differential diagnosis of a creeping eruption is the lava clearance, which means um, a running lava of the strongyloidiasis. This is the main differential diagnosis. And lava clearance, has a prominent um, urticaria component and is notable, is notable for its rapidity. The lava tract of the 
of the lava crevice can progress approximately 1 cm in five minutes and as much as 5 to 15 cm per hour. So this is quite fast, unlike what we see in the cutaneous lava migrant that will just, uh, that will just uh, move 1 cm per day, 1 to 2 cm per day. And the diagnosis of chondylitis is established by lava detection and or serology. Other differential diagnoses are as listed there, the natostomiasis, doasis, drunconcholiasis, paragonomiasis, contact dermatitis, and impetigo. Treatment. The preferred treatment for this condition is ivermectin, where the patient will receive 200 micrograms per kilogram orally. And this can be taken once daily for one to two, one to two days. And acceptable alternative is albendazole, so where this patient receives 400 milligrams orally, preferably with fatty meals for three days. Topical tiabendazole could also be um, used. It's also important to give this patient antihistamine. Antihistamines as the pruritus, the pruritus is quite marked. Prognosis. The prognosis of cutaneous lava migrant is excellent. Most times, this condition can even, um, the condition is self-limiting. And as we all know that humans are accidental hosts, accidental dead-end hosts with the lava dying and the lesion resolving within four to eight weeks. So these are my references. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, for Dr. Ijuma, for that beautiful presentation. So please, let's give the thanks coming on the chat. And then we'll, we'll entertain comments and questions from the participants first. Um, sorry. Uh, please, did you talk about uh, diagnosis? Anything about... Um, yes, yes I talked about diagnosis. It's actually a clinical diagnosis, mainly clinical. When we okay. see, we take um, relevant history, we have relevant history on the physical examination. It's a clinical diagnosis. Okay, I was just th thinking aloud, can something like histology, can it be done? It can be done, yeah. but it's really needed. It's really needed in this condition. Okay. Okay, so everyone is applauding you for the beautiful presentation. Dr. Dipping Pee says thank for the excellent presentation. Dr. Rolly says thank you, Dr. Ijama, for the beautiful presentation. Dr. Anthony says excellent presentation. Chief Ijama, explain albendazole with fatty meals. Okay, albendazole, it's actually an anti amniotic medication. Abs absorption is um, it's better when taken with fatty meals. So that's basically why um, it, I, I mentioned that it should be taken orally, preferably with fatty meals, like milk and other foods that are rich in fat, to aid absorption. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, I just wanted to ask, um, can um, Skibis and senior also be a differential? Yes, there are differentials because of um, the pruritus that is common in um, all these conditions. There are differentials of this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so you have more applause. Dr. Nelo Mneka says thanks. Dr. Kalamal says thank you for an extensive presentation. Dr. Alozi Wugu. Please thanks, Dr. Cyrus. Okay. Thank you very much for the presentation. Maybe, maybe that I missed it. What is the what are the possible complications? Okay, thank you for that question. That yeah. Okay, the main complication. Um how it's this um this lesion could get secondarily infected. That's that causing impetigo. That's usually the um the main complication we may have here, secondary infec infection of the cutaneous lesion. However, okay. it rarely has uh, any form of systemic uh, manifestation. Okay. Okay, so uh, satellite is too. 
Then Dr. Momodo is thanking you. Thanks so yeah. much. Then Dr. Araga says, demoscopy can be done for diagnosis in some instances. Thank you so much, Dr. Araga. Okay, I don't know if there's any hands up. Okay, I can't see any electronic hands yet. Okay, so thank you for the presentation. Can ivermectin be used as part of the treatment? Okay, I think she mentioned that. Ivermectin and then albendazole and antihistamines. Okay, thank you. So do we have any more comments? Okay, so in absence of any other uh, comments, I'll hand over to our teachers. Mark Christopher. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ijoma. That was wonderful. She did a wonderful job. It's actually a straightforward presentation and she did justice to it. So thank you so much. Uh, I don't know if you can, uh, I don't know if you did, I don't know if you can differentiate between uh, lab occurrence and discontinuous lava migrants. Okay, okay, thank you for that. Um, okay, to differentiate between um, and the lava occurrence and continuous lava migrant, one key thing is the rate of movement of this lava of the, the rate of movement in the tenor slava migrant is quite slow, basically one to two cm per day, whereas that of lava currents, it's quite rapid. It's very rapid and can move as much as five cm to 15 cm per hour. The location, most times I would see um, the tenor slava migrants most times on the lower extremities, but that does not mean we cannot see it commonly on the lower extremities where the lava will come in contact with um, the individual. Whereas in lava currents, we, we commonly see that around the buttocks, around the genital area, because this, um, it's usually as a result of the auto-infection by the um, strongyloidis. That's auto-infection we see in strongyloidiasis. So we see it around the buttocks, around the anal region, where we see the um, lava moving quite fast. So these are more or less the main things we can use to differentiate that. The rapidity, which is the key um, thing, and the location. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. So what you do for us is uh, just help us put a table at the, maybe at the end of your slide, so that just in case, and if you can put a picture too, just in case. Thank you so much. We appreciate you. I don't know if any of our teachers have any comments. Chief Cookie, my any comment? Fatima, any comment? Dahatu, congratulations once again, Dr. Dahatu. No comment, ma. She did well. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Dr. Ijuma, once again, I appreciate you. Thank you so much for your time. Congratulations to your exam. Uh, Dr. Ekele, over to you. I'll move over to the next presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Ma. Thank you, Dr. Ijuma. Um, okay, Dr. Afyong. Um, please, can someone help us share the slide, Dr. Vimpe, Dr. Mamadou? Hello, Dr. Afyong. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Chief. Okay. Okay, thank you, Dr. Mamadu. Good morning. Is um Good morning. 
I'm presenting herpes simplex virus. Um, oh, I'm sorry, the, because of the short notice, it's a little haphazard. I did not, there was no table of contents. So the next slide is introduction. Now this herpes family, group, herpes virus, group of viruses, they contain six important human pathogens, herpes simplex virus types one and two, varicella, zusta virus, cytomegalovirus, epstein barr virus, and human herpes virus AIDS, also known as Kaposi sarcoma associated virus. But this discussion is on herpes simplex. This next slide, this is the diagram of um, the herpes simplex virus. You can see the nucleocapsid, you see the nucleus, the surface proteins, the membrane glycoproteins, and the viral DNA genome. Please, next slide. Now, um, all the herpes viruses are structurally, structurally similar. They have they all have an icosahedral core, which is surrounded by a lipoprotein envelope, as seen in the picture in the, in the second slide. And the genome is actually a linear double-stranded DNA. So it's a double-stranded DNA virus. And the virion does not contain any poly uh, polymerase. And they are usually large, about 120 to 200 nanometers in diameter. And note that herpes virus replicates in the, in the nucleus. And then the structure of the herpes contains regulatory proteins such as transcription and translation factors. And this helped to play a role in the viral replication. Please, next slide. Now this herpes simplex virus, is you have type one and type two, and they are distinguished by two main criteria. That is an, by antigenicity and the location of the lesion. So lesions caused by HSV1 are in general above the waist, while those caused by HSV2 are below the waist. And HSV1 causes acute gingival stomatitis Recurrent herpes labialis, that is, you have cold, um, cold sores around the mouth, and keratal conjunctivitis in the eyes. And it can cause encephalitis in the brain. And for HSV2, it causes, remember I said it causes um, um, lesions are below the waist, herpes genitalis, that is, genital herpes. And then when a mother, a pregnant woman has it, she can transmit it to the uh, fetus and it will eventually lead to neonatal encephalitis and other forms of neonatal sepsis. And you can, this HSV2 can also cause aseptic um, meningitis. And then, interestingly, the infection by HS, um, herpes simplex virus, both one and two is a common causes of Erythema multiforme. So please, next slide. So you can see the sores, the cold sores, the infection. This is herpes simplex one. Then the next one, this is herpes simplex two, virus two. You see the ulcers on the genitals. So the next slide. Next slide, please. So this cycle begins when the HSV binds to the heparan sulfate. Heparan sulfate is part of the cell surface, cell membrane. And then it also binds to another second receptor called the nectin. And then the, there is a fusion of the viral envelope of the herpes simplex virus with the cell membrane. And then because of, um, after that, you have um, the tegument proteins are now released into the cytoplasm. And now this viral nucleocapsid is transported into 
the new clones. Remember, I told you that all herpes viruses they multiply they 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 multiply in the nucleus. So when the viral nucleocapsid enters the nucleus, you have um interaction with the cellular transcription transcription factors, and this will activate transcription of virus the virus immediately. And then you have multiplication, division, and then the mRNA, mRNA is now translated and you have regulation of the synthesis of early proteins such as um, DNA po polymerase that replicates. You have replication. Actually, the summary is, next slide, please. The next slide is going to show is a diagrammatic um, description. You see the virus now fuses with the plasma membrane and then it goes inward to the cytoplasm and then from there it's channeled to the nucleus and then the nucleus it undergoes changes, transcription, early transcription, late transcription, DNA packaging, and then it replicates. And then from there it's extruded out of the nucleus and then through micro tubular outward transport, it now goes to the membrane and then it's released by, exo um, there's budding and it's released by exocytosis. This next slide. Now, HSV1 is transmitted primarily in the saliva, while HSV2 is transmitted by sexual contact. And then HSV1 infection occurs mainly in the face, while HSV2 lesions occurs in the genital area. Now, although transmission occurs most often when active lesions are present, you can have asymptomatic shedding of both HSV1 and HSV2. Even when the patient is um, asymptomatic, you may still have shedding of this virus and it plays an important role in the transmission. Next slide. Now, um, epidemiology. Um, well, this HSV1, Please, next slide. Okay, okay, no. Now, this, it's, it's, it's the most common, I, I did not see our, um, Nigerian studies, but it's the second most common sexually transmitted infection in the US, according to the CDC. The most common is the human papilloma virus. And in the past, though, like I, remember I mentioned early, earlier, that HIV usually affects um, um, the uh, um, the face and the associated with cold sores, sores. Why HSV2 is associated with genital region? That was in the past, but because of this, the new um, oral sex and everything, you you can have HSV1 affecting the genitals and HSV affecting the mouth. And then approximately 50 million people are infected with HSV2. And about one in six Americans age 14 to 49 is infected with HSV2. And HSV1 is an increasing important cause of genital herpes. In, in a large study, that is younger women ages between ages 18 and 22 were more likely to become infected with HSV1 than HSV2. So you find it in sexually active people. Now, next slide. And then about 90, interestingly, about 90%. This, next slide, next slide. About 90% of people who share the HSV2 virus have no history of genital herpes. Remember I mentioned that sometimes in asymptomatic cases, you, they still, asymptomatic cases still share the virus. And then oral sex with a person with oral herpes may result in genital herpes in the partner. And it can be transmitted from mother to child during delivery. And the women are more susceptible to genital herpes uh, with both HSV1 and HSV2. And then it's more common in younger women than older women. And then black women have the highest prevalence of HSV2. 
And then the lifetime number of sex partners increases the prevalence. And then it can be transmitted from mother to child. And um, next slide. Next slide. This virus replicates in the skin or mucous membrane at the initial site of infection. And then I, I described this earlier anyway. It migrates up to, it actually migrates up the neuron by re retrograde, trans this is um, the transport of the HSV in the body. So when it replicates in the skin or a mucous membrane, it migrates up the new neuron by retrograde azonal flow. And then it becomes latent in the sensory ganglion cells. It concentrates in the ganglion cells, sensory ganglion cells. And then this HSV1 becomes latent in the trigeminal ganglia, while HSV2 becomes latent in the lumbar and sacral line, uh, ganglia. So you have HSV1 concentrating in the trigeminal ganglia and HSV2 concentrating in the lumbar and sacral Ganglia. And then this virus can be reactivated from the latent state by a very variety of inducers like sunlight, trauma, stress, fever, hormonal changes, at which time it migrates down the neuron and replicates in the skin, causing lesions. So you can have dormant stages, sta stages of this condition. Please, next slide. Now, what is the difference between HSV1 and HSV2? Both types infect the body mucosal surfaces, usually mouth or genitals, and then they establish latency in the nervous system. For both types, at least two thirds of infected people have no symptoms, and symptoms may be mild, too mild to notice. However, both types can reoccur spread, and even after a period in which there are no symptoms, they can still spread and propagate. Now the difference, next slide, the difference. Next slide, please. HSV1 I mean, um, establishes a latency in the trigeminal ganglion. It, that is a collection of nerves. This trigeminal ganglion is a collection of nerves near the ear. And then it tends to occur in the lower lip of face. Why HSV2? establishes the latency in the sacral region at the base of the sp spine. From there, it reoccurs, it removes to the genitals. And then next slide. Remember I said, because of the prevailing circumstances, now this new, uh, the sexual um, contact, a patient, can, someone can have HSV-1, both genitally and orally. And HSV-1 is usually mild. And then it can affect the eye, causing ocular, ocular herpes, and which can eventually lead to blindness. It can even spread to brain, causing herpetis, herpes encephalitis, which can eventually lead to death. Next slide. HSV-2. Can HSV-2. HIV, HIV, Two, really causes complications. Uh, it really spreads to other parts of the body. But if, but when an infection does occur, you can have oral outbreaks. It can also cause encephalitis, but it's, but it's, it's very, but that one is rare. And then um, symptoms, they usually have, okay, um, symptoms, I, I mentioned earlier, they can have flu-like symptoms, cold slurs, um, fever, swollen glands. Please go down. Go, okay, symptoms, they can have cold, slur, cold sores, flu-like symptoms, including fever and swollen glands, and ulcers. Please go down. Next slide, please. Next slide. Now, genital herpes infection increases the risk of acquiring H, um, HIV-2 because of the, you know, you, um, you have um, um, ulcers in the genital area. So genital herpes infection 
That is, it actually increases the risk of transmitting HIV infection about fourfold. Next slide. HIV affects primary, primarily affects nervous system. And then when it affects CNS, it causes HIV and, and encephalitis, which is very fatal. And then if it, it, you find it in the neck region, if you have, you can find it in the neck region or you can find it in the thoracic sensory nerves. And then you can, if it affects the fingers, you can have um, hepatic weaklow. And then in genital herpes, you, okay, I mentioned this earlier, that the lumbosacral sensory nerves are infected. And then next slide, please. Neonatal herpes results from transmission from mother to infant. And it can be HSV1, HSV2 can be transmitted to the baby. And the, if the mother is infected, 30 to 50% of vaginally delivered in fact, in infants become infected. And then if a mother has a recurrence of herpes during pregnancy, less than 8%, newborns become infected. Please, new slide. So the next slide shows the incidence of neonatal sepsis. Um, if it's untreated, if it's untreated, it can cause death and brain damage in baby. So it's important that a pregnant woman informs her doctor if she or her husband might have herpes or had a history of herpes in the past. Now the lab diagnosis, cell culture, ELISA, that is an enzyme. Please, next, next slide, please. Cell culture is an important diagnostic procedure for isolation of the virus. Then the enzyme limbs in immunosorbent assays which detects virus-specific glycoproteins. And then you can have a rapid diagnostic test from skin lesion that is using the Zang smear, where cells from the base of the vesicles are stained with GEMSA stain. Then a PCR, PCR assay can be used to detect HSV1 DNA in the spinal fluid. And then you have serological tests. And then um, the differential diagnosis. Please, next slide. Sorry. I did, hello? I didn't include this in my slide because of the hurry. Differential diagnosis, happy zusta, abthos ulcer, hepangina, pemphigoid, and syphilitic ulcer. Now, the treatment. There is no cure. There is actually no cure for... There's no cure for herpes. There's no cure, but there are antiviral drugs which reduce the duration of lesions and viral shedding, but they don't eliminate the infection. So genital herpes patients who are experiencing chronic stress should consider also being treated for their stress to prevent to break out. Next slide. Next slide. Now there are several prescription medications, antiviral medications like um, acyclovir, famcyclovir, pencyclovir. And acyclovir was a, is a, was the original and prototype member of this class. Next slide. So mechanism of action of um, this anti-acyclovir. Acyclovir and pan pencyclovir work by interfering with viral replication and effectively slow the replication rate of the virus and provide a greater opportunity for the immune response to intervene. All the drugs in this class depend on the activity of the viral thy thymidine kinase to convert the drug into a monophosphate form and subsequently interfere with the viral DNA. Now, there are other drugs, there are other drugs, medications 
that are used, like first generation medication. I think these were the first set of drugs that were used to treat them. I do I I doxyrubin and try flu rubin and adenine arabinoside. Then the second generation drugs are acyclovir, which I've mentioned before, and then third generation drugs are adeno arabinoside and um, adeno arabinoside and others are interferon, ribavirin, and isoprenocin. Now, prevention for unmarried individuals, sexual abstinence is the only practical and certain way to avoid herpes. For those who choose to be sexually active, a marriage that is a marriage is the healthiest choice. That is a mutually faithful, lifelong relationship with an uninfected sexual partner. Then vaccines. I'm sorry for the next one, the next slide. Well, NIH in America started um, exploring the use of a clinical trial vaccine, HSV2 vaccine. And it appears to be about 50% effective, but it has not been approved. There is no approved vaccine for now for HSV. Thank you for listening. I think I think that thanks for listening. That's the end. Thank you. Please, I will need support. Addition. Sorry, the time was so short, so I just hurriedly, quickly, run through um assemble the slides. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Moafian for the beautiful presentation. Thank you so much. So we'll take comments and questions from the participants first, and let's keep the thanks coming on the chat. Okay, so Dr. Yusuf Rahim says, thanks for the presentation. Please kindly repeat the differential diagnosis again. Hello, Dr. Afyong. Happy Zusta. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, ma. Happy Zusta. Aptos ulcers, hep angina, pemphigoid, and syphilitic, syphilis, 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 syphilis. Even syphilitic ulcers can present that. That is look like looks like that. So those are the differential diagnoses. All right, thank you. Okay, and just to add to that, so nipple granuloma venerum. Okay. Granuloma inguinale. Yes, some CMV infections and some fixed drug eruptions can also be differentials. Thank you so much. Okay, so do we have more comment comments? Um okay, so you have a lot of applause on the chat. Dr. Kalama is saying thanks, Dr. Bassi. Well appreciated. Dr. Anthony says, this was exhaustive, Chief Afyong. Thank you so much. Dr. Bless Namadi says, thanks so much for the presentation. Dr. Raleigh says, thank you for the beautiful presentation. Dr. Anthony is asking, please, oh, can you some really differentiate HSV1 and 2? Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Um, HSV1 is primarily found in saliva, why HSV2 is transmitted by sexual contact. And then you have um, HSV1, you have cold sores. Whenever you see a picture of someone with sores in the mouth, um, um, with small, tiny vesicles in the around the mouth, the tongue, the mucosal areas, you think of um, HSV-1. Why HSV-2 is associated with genital lesions. You have ulcers, you have itchy, that is the patient complains of itching and pain around the genital and anal regions, and you see vesicles and ulcers. So that's HSV-2. And... Um, 
What else? I think that, that's basically what you see. I think that's basically the difference. Both of them infect mucosal surfaces. So whenever you see all these lesions in mucosal surfaces, in the mouth, you, th you think of HSV-1. In the genitals, you think of HS HSV-2. All right, thank you so much. And then, okay, and then HSV-1 can occur in the eye. You can have ocular herpes and can lead to blindness. HSV-2 really reaches the eye and brain. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Okay, sorry, please, can you go over the diagnosis again? Maybe like um, the investigations, how do you investigate? Please, can you, I, yeah, okay. I missed an, it. An important diagnostic procedure is the isolation of the virus from the lesion by the growth by growth in cell culture. And then you do detecting, the next one is the you, um, enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, that's ELISA, is used for detecting the virus-specific glycoprotein. And then there's zinc smear. I don't know, I think, I, I don't know how, I'm not a dermatologist. I don't know how to pronounce it well. C-Z-A-N-C-K, zinc smear is also done. It's a rapid diagnosis from the skin lesion. And that is where you, the, in which the cells from the base of the vesicle are stained with GEMSA stain. And then you do a PCR, especially in patients that have encephalitis. So you get um, spinal fluid, and then you do run a PCR assay. And then right. okay. serological test. There are serological tests for that. All right, thank you so, so much. Okay, I don't know if we have more comments. Okay, so thanks, Chief. Just to note that the with practices like fellatio, you can have a reversal of HSV2 affecting oral mucosa and HSV1 affecting genitals. Thank you so much, Dr. Justice. All right, I don't know if I have more comments. I don't see any electronic hands raised. Okay, so at this point, I'll hand over to our teachers. Thank you, Isabel. Well, thank you, Dr. Afion. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Dr. Ekade, thank you. I most appreciate those that comment. I don't know why the class is quiet this morning. Nobody seems to want to speak up. Who are those in infectious disease, dermatology? Can't hear your voice, so hmm? please. Oh, I don't know. Is it because there is hands? <laughs> please, we want to hear your voice, please. I want to hear your voice. Also, Mahmoud, put up your hand and ask me. What question is that one, Mahmoud? <laughs> I don't know what Felashu is. Felashu is oral sex. He's innocent now. He's very innocent. innocent now. Oral sex. In this He's case, the, um, the, the, woman, the lady that is oral and the man is using his normal tool. That's Felashu. Then the reverse is um is it conilingus or something like that? <laughs> Chief, very good, thank you. So I don't know if any of our teachers have any comments. Um well I joined late, so I, I didn't really catch most of it, but I understand that um Dr. Fiong had a little time. There are so many um, issues with that her slide. Though. It was obvious she was just cut, cutting and pasting because of the little time. She didn't edit some things. You see some references. Uh -uh. Please, before you send it to us, help us edit out some of those things, okay? And then uh, thank you for taking up the challenge with the little notice. But I also noticed that in your prevention, you are just talking about married. Ah. Uh, uh, how about people that are not married? Can they have sex too? Uh, how, how would they prevent? Would condom help? So remember, we are, we are doctors. We are not uh, pastors or imams. Uh -huh. So um, I, I expected you to comment on, on whether condom can be 
preventive or not. You are just talking about abstinence and um when you are when you are married, you can be you should be um faithful and all those things. Okay, so can condom help? Thank you. Thank you, sir. It's all okay, please. Can you just answer this? Okay. Can condom help? Um, for genital herpes, I think it can. It can. It can help. It can actually help, especially for couples that are not married. It can help. It can help. Okay, so, but it's important to note that it can help only for the conventional um sex. But if somebody is having the other ones like fellatio, I don't think people use condoms for those ones. Fellatio and conilingus. So it might be, it might not, of course, condom will not help in that kind of situation. So, all right. Okay, thank you so much. Uh. Thank you for your comment. I appreciate you. Uh, Dr. Dr. Afion, please, can you go through your investigations again? I don't know if I missed something. Thank you. Okay, the investigation. I mentioned yes. cell, cell culture, ELISA, Zang smear, and PCR, and then serological tests. Like surgical test, like what, please? Uh, I think a life size is a serological test. That's what I think. Anyway, what I was driving at is um, when somebody has a sexually transmitted infection, you also want to um, check for other sexually transmitted infections because most times. They tend to go together. So that is promiscuous is promiscuous. So uh, they're picking up herpes, they are picking up HIV, they are picking up hepatitis, syphilis, and all. So you screen for all that sexually transmitted infection. So that's what I was driving at. So please, once you're done with specific tests for your herpes, for the herpes. Okay. Also, also check for all the um sexually transmitted infections because if they have others. You want to also manage them. So, so we always encourage early diagnosis and management. The earlier these conditions are, are, are detected, the earlier they it improve their problem. Just imagine you're managing somebody for syphilis, which is bad, but you didn't check for HIV and the patient, patient is HIV positive. 20, 10, 5, 10 years down the line, the patient is coming down with HIV and another cardiomyopathies and all. You're like, ah, where is this coming from? You could have helped the patient better. So that's why you go round and round and round. Make okay. sure that there are no other issues. And you also want to, to get baseline investigations for this patient. You know, when you are being asked investigations in any presentation, any exam, you want to go for the specific and the non-specific. Baseline is also very important. Remember that some patients you don't give some of these drugs to. You want to check, is the kidney? Can the kidney handle it? Can the liver handle it? You know, the arena dose, the liver dose, you know, all manner of things. You want to check, is this patient diabetic? You know, those things are important. It we alter and treat your management. That's why management in any condition is patient dependent, not really depend on anything, but depend on the patient that is directly in front of you. So all these baseline investigations, they are also important then also i think there's something i wanted to yes um there's something you miss i don't think they will really they will really i'm just putting that there for information um if you say fine if you don't say it, i don't think any anybody will really be against you for not saying it beside now now we we'll come to realize that um um as why those of us are social media active we tend to tell people do not kiss people's children. Do not kiss people's children. Leave them, leave their children alone. And even you as a parent, do not kiss your child. There should not be, there should not be, because that we like it or not, the, the morality of the 
of the Jedi's generation is something else. Understand? A married man is 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 is, is, as, is as worse as somebody that is not even married. That's so terrible these days. So married women do terrible things. You do these terrible things outside. I'll come and kiss an innocent child at home. So even if it's your child, do not kiss that child. Because if you have a peace, you transmit it to that child. So it's not just true delivery only. Even when you uh, kiss that child, you can transmit the infection to that child. Then also, people that share um, um, cosmetics, those that share lip gloss, lipstick, please wow. avoid avoid it. Because if wow. somebody has a piece, they are going to pick it up. Especially if the person just finished using it and just give it to you. Okay. They want very close differential to just in case. Just this thing is just information, not really for exam ready. We've seen situations that's how we tell people experiences, sort of tests, that's how we wish that in this part of the world we can get grant to publish some of our findings. Now, one very close differential to oral EPs is fish drug eruption. There was a patient that uh, I was managing for herpes, but there was an history he gave me. Initially, he didn't notice that. That's why history is very important. He didn't notice that history. So they tell the doctor, so they tell that doctor, wait to chief, this is what's happening. Anytime you take any particular drug, I won't mention it so that this is one air. Anytime you take a particular drug, it has oral lesions vesicular, you know, the usual typical <laughs> um, uh, hip- I'll ask guy, what have you been doing? Uh, <laughs> you have to be more cautious though. So, so we're managing for herpes. But the second episode told me that way too. I noticed each time I take this particular drug, this is what happens. I say, are you serious? Okay. We did we did we did a trial. I we treat I treated him. No, I didn't treat him for herpes anymore. I treated him like normal uh, uh, reaction to drug. And I told him, now let's test this your theory. And it's deep to the job degree. In fact, I take the job within 24 hours, there were, fear, there were new eruptions. So now we've confirmed that that particular job causes that for him. So all this is just information based. So that when you see somebody that has these lesions, if this drug eruption can also be a differential for this type of patient. So I uh, thank you once again, Dr. Afion. We know the time was short. Thank you. I appreciate your time the time you use in preparing for this slide. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. All our teachers, thank you. I don't need any more comments. Uh, so I'll close the class. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. We appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you.